Hello, you're on the air. Hi, I just want to say that when you mix up the word Elvis, you get the word lives. But you can also get the word veils, which is what people wear to funerals. Therefore, I believe Elvis is dead. That's an interesting point. We've got another caller. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, l listen, I don't want to talk about Elvis being dead or alive. You know, I, I want to talk about the fall of communism. Do you think it was caused by Elvis somehow? We can only wonder. And if you just tuned in, you're listening to Elvis Talk. Call us locally at 555-KING, which is 555-5464, or 1-800-484-8484. That's 1-800-HA-HA-HA. Hello, Elvis Talk. Yeah. <clears throat> Some guy came into Arnold's Pizza the other day and ordered 57 peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Fried. And then he shot out on TV. You think it was Elvis? Well, it's hard to say. We got another caller. I think mixing up Elvis's given name to find out what he is or isn't is ludicrous. What's important are the backward messages he left in his last few hits. While listening to Suspicious Minds, I discovered that Elvis tells us where he is today. Here, just listen. Did you hear that? I think it's plain as day. Thanks for calling. Hello, you're on the air. Uh, we were watching an Elvis film festival last week on cable, and we have this blunder that hadn't worked in ages. And during Blue Hawaii, when Elvis sang, all of a sudden it started whirring. My husband about fell off the divan. We were, we were so happy we made a batch of Blue Hawaiians. Well, thanks for the story. Hello, Elvis Talk. I just want to say that I've been mixing up Elvis's full name as it appears on his gravestone for over ten years. And I've formed the words, lives on as Al Yerper and lives on as Leper Ray. Amazing. If there's anybody listening who knows of an Al Yerper or of a leper named Ray, please give us a call. Hello, you're on the air. Hello, my name is Al Yerper, and I'm sick of all you weirdos bugging me. It's hard enough being Elvis incognito without a bunch of crazies calling me and following me around. Sorry, Al. Hello, Elvis Talk. Oh, hello, hello. I'm, uh, I'm a leper named uh, uh, Dave, and uh, I, I know a leper named Ray, and, uh, and he's not Elvis. Uh, in fact, I don't know any lepers who are Elvis, so, uh, so leave us alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you, Dave. Hello, Elvis Talk. Uh, I recently purchased a black velvet painting of Elvis on a crucifix, and his eyes follow you wherever you go. Lately, I've noticed that his upper lip seems to quiver, too. Now, is it supposed to do that, or can this be recognized as a miracle by the Catholic Church? Buddy, you're insane. I think you need some... We interrupt the current cultured entertainment with an important news flash. I'm Quint Quigley. Russian Premier Mikhail Gorbachev recently won the Nobel Peace Prize. The controversial initiator of Glasnost and Perestroika won the prize at the Coney Island Amusement Park, where he knocked over three stacked milk bottles with only one baseball. He chose the Nobel Prize over the pink-haired Cupid doll, which had already been picked by American Vice President J. Danforth Quayle. In local news, the decision-making seminar has been moved back to 8 o'clock on Monday the 29th. This, of course, comes after it had already been moved back to 7 o'clock on Thursday the 25th and before that 9 o'clock on Sunday the 21st. Angela Kulazu, coordinator of the decision-making seminar, says that she's thinking about giving up the whole idea altogether, but she really hasn't given it much thought. We now return to our regular KBUT programming. <laughs> This is Skip Edwards. Today on People Who Make a Difference, we're talking to Heather Shields. Although she's only a sophomore in college, Heather is already actively involved in issues of the environment. Welcome, Heather. Thanks, Skip. Heather, we hear so much about the apathy of today's younger generation, but you've proven that's not all. The young people are unconcerned. You're actually assisting in the search for sanitary landfill space? Yes, Skip, that's right. Oh, I mean, there's so much concern about the lack of landfill space. Well, Skip, I guess you could say that my roommate is trash. <laughs> I think you'll need to elaborate on that for our listeners. Well, you see, my roommate moved out last spring, so I decided to earn money by renting out that extra room as a sanitary landfill space. What kind of things uh, do you store? Oh, anything, really, from things that decay in a day to things that never break down. <laughs> never break down? Uh, what do you mean? Like plastic, styrofoam... Actually, styrofoam is my favorite thing to store because it's light, and it doesn't smell either. That's important to me. So you don't store a lot of uh, biodegradables? Not too much, especially in the summer. It's too hot, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. But, Heather, why would you prefer sharing your living quarters with garbage instead of a person? <laughs> well, it's a lot quieter, for one thing. And I really feel like I'm doing something to help the world. 
You know, I started doing this for the money, but I've come to realize how important it is. But realistically, how much can you be helping? You have a two-bedroom apartment. That's not much space. <sighs> yes, I worried about that, too. That's why I'm turning my attention to storing nuclear waste. I think that's even more important than storing styrofoam. I'm expecting the first shipment any minute now. Nuclear waste? Isn't that dangerous? <laughs> no, not really. I had my linen closet lined with lead. It's really a trade-off, you know? We all have to make sacrifices. I mean, I know that there'll be some radioactive leakage. That's why I stopped going to the tanning booth. Well, Heather, this is an incredible commitment on your part. It's the least I can do. Besides, it pays my tuition. Would you recommend this for other young people? Oh, definitely. It's up to everyone to do a little bit. Skip, I'm sorry, I have to go. That's my shipment of nuclear waste. She's a knockout, he's a vegetable. Together they fight to keep him alive in the wackiest marriage ever. Honey, get off that doctor's chair. But don't you love me? Oh, I wish you were in a coma. Okay. <laughs> it's laughs of plenty as Kathy B. Crosby and Roddy Benson star in Life Goes Up. Highbrow humor, Tuesdays on Fox. This Sunday, come down to Hanger Auditorium for the Super Colossal Battle of the Monster Trucks. All new, all day, all action! See Isaac Perlman and his terror tractor take on Juliet Browse and the cast of Maine. Catch the hot action as Branford Marcellus and his mega machine take on the Bali dance troupe and the Negro theatrical ensemble company. Feel their shake as the London Philharmonic piles into their tornado truck and go up against the world's greatest living soprano, Jesse Norman. Norman and the Bolshoi Ballet. Feel the sky tremble this Sunday at Hancher Auditorium. Prepare to have your brain demolished as you catch the mega hot Battle of the Monster Trucks. Hosted by Alistair Mad Dog Cook. Ultra hot. Ultra destructive. This Sunday. Hello, radio listeners. This is Gromius Clip here at the Cedar Rapids Airport. In KPUT's constant search for decent entertainment, they have sent me to investigate the glamorous yet harrowing world of airline travel, where the pilots are sloshed, the stewardesses take off their clothes at least three times a day, and few passengers exit the plane unscarred by the modern phenomenon that is airline travel. In short, it is the perfect sort of thing to capture with a hidden mic, label entertainment, and shove down your throats, which is what I, Gromius Clip, intend to do with the assistance of my Boyorama machine, which I have here. Over here, man. Looks like we've missed a suitcase. Get your mitts off of me. You can drop the disguise. We know that underneath that clever costume, you're a suitcase, and you're trying to sneak away. I'm not a suitcase. I'm a peeping Tom. Ha! You're dealing with professionals, my fine vinyl friend. Just last week, I spotted a steamer trunk and on a flight bag deceptively dressed as an Anglican bishop and a Trappist monk. And in mere minutes, they were on their proper flight to Amsterdam. Roof them up some more, boys! Bye! Ooh, blah. Ooh, blah. travel by plane very often. Oh, yes. This is keeps me in the air several times a week. Not me. How's that? I said, not me. This is my first flight in years. I'm not partial to heights. There's nothing to be afraid of. Oh, that's what they say. More people are smashed to bits and chopped up on U.S. highways than skyways. That's comforting. On the other hand, when your car stalls, you pull over to the side of the road, but if we were to... Stall- anyway... <laughs> This flight <laughs> seems to be getting more bumpy as we go. Yeah, I haven't noticed. Wow, what an awesome view. That's breathtaking. Say, you care to switch places so you can have the window? Oh, no. No, no, not not at all, no. The, the aisle's fine, really. Mm, suit yourself. Good afternoon. Would you gentlemen care for something to drink? Yeah, well, I'll take a cherry Coke if you have it. I-, I need something more settling. May I have milk? Yes, sir. Um... Are you all right? You seem a bit flushed. Well, I... Ah, he says he doesn't fly much. He's afraid we'll crash and be scattered all over the hillside. Actually, all this bouncing around has kind of shaken me up. I guess it's just something you get used to. We'll be coming down soon. Coming down? Landing, sir. Oh. Your milk? Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, oh careful, I, careful. Dear uh, me. I guess you're not accustomed to turbulence. I'll get a napkin and another milk. Oh, that's okay. Just the napkin. All right. Good day, passengers. You're listening to Flight Captain A.J. <laughs> Tailspin. Don't be nervous if this is your first flight. It's mine, too. <laughs> what? Just kidding. Uh, uh, You'll notice the seatbelt sign is now lit. That's because we're cruising into some very dense fog. And hey... 
we can't see. But sit back, relax, and put your feet up. I can just figure out these instruments in a short order. So, enjoy your flight. <laughs> enjoy your flight? Excuse me, sir. <laughs> it seems my son has gotten ill. Will you be using your barf bag? Oh, well, Thank actually, you. I... <coughs> oh, say, I thought this was a smoke-free flight. Well, it's supposed to be. Sorry to bug you again, folks. No need to be concerned by the nominal amount of smoke you may notice billowing from the cockpit. The crew is getting a small electrical fire under control. So chill out. Relax. A <coughs> small amount of smoke? Gee. Oh, no. This can't be. Oh, no. What is it? What, what now? Rasta Perina is attempting to buy out Oscar Meyer and Clausen. Oh. Do you realize what this will do to the rental stock? Here, oh. it's right here. I can't read the paper now. Again, passengers, this is Flight Captain A.J. Tailspin. Oh, my. What else could go wrong? <laughs> Cheerful travelers, I'm going to dip the left wing of the plane, and you'll notice through the very dense fog an occasional glimpse of the Niagara Falls. It's a wonder worth seeing, even at 30,000 feet. Oh, yeah. Hey, do you see that, buddy? Look over there. No, but I do see that there's an engine on fire! One of the engines is burning! We're gonna die! Niagara has to be one of the most tranquil places on Earth. I hope I can enjoy it up close soon. No, don't say that! Your napkin, sir? That's right. Oh, I'll need more than a napkin. I've wet myself. Oh, my. Captain A.J. Tailspin with good news. Finally! Some of you may have noticed the eeny-weeny little bitty fire caused when engine number three went kablooey. Well, say, prior to that time, we developed about an inch of solid ice on the wings, resulting from the moisture of the fog and the very cold weather. Well... Wouldn't you know, the fire melted the ice. Now we'll hope for more good fortune to melt the ice on the other wing. So sit back and leave the flying to me. I'm going to puke. Look at this. The Times Sports Editor predicts the Cowboys are going to bounce back all the way to the Super Bowl next year. <laughs> Can you believe that? I don't think I'm going to be enjoying the football season or any other season next year. Yeah, you're not a sports fan, huh? Say what happened to the lights? Yeah, how's the guy supposed to read in here? Stewardess! Yes, sir? The lights! There's no lights! What's happening? The electrical fire in the cockpit has permanently damaged the power source switcher. You mean there's no electrical power on this plane? There's no need to be alarmed. Restroom lighting has a backup power supply. The bathroom? Well, 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 what, what about the cockpit? What about the instruments? Oh, oh, sir, we reserve all the backup power for the convenience of our passengers. Only the bathroom and the onboard radar unit are on the backup system. <laughs> well, well at, le at least this thing has radar. No need to be alarmed, folks. What now? But the onboard radar unit, you know, the one which normally goes bleep, 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 well, it's now going... <laughs> So, don't be concerned. My co-pilot says he's landed without radar or panel instruments several times. Oh, no. I said I've seen it done once. <laughs> oh, I should have taken the bus. <laughs> I should have stayed home. Gentlemen, we're approaching our destination and we'll be landing shortly. Please remain seated with your belts fastened. Oh, don't worry. Oops, folks. AJ Tailspin again. This is getting embarrassing. Well, the power outage has apparently affected the hydraulic system also. We'll be coming in with out landing gear. But that's all the same because Central Tower radioed and advised us that the runway we'll be using is snow and sleet covered. <laughs> of course, that was while our radio was still functioning. Why me? Why now? I'm too young. <laughs> Oh, sometimes I just can't get over the far side. Hey, you seen the days? Look at this. Oh, leave me alone! Just leave me alone! Oh, oh buddy, you should have checked that barf bag. Please remain seated with your seatbelts on until the plane has come to a complete stop. The temperature here is a crispy, cool 27 degrees under partly cloudy skies with wind at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We hope you enjoy your stay here in the gateway to the north. Hey, buddy. You okay? I told you there was nothing to be afraid of. Hey, buddy. Hey. Stewardess? Yes, sir? You two may leave now. Is everything all right? Oh, yeah. I had a great flight. I'd, I'd never seen the falls before, but uh, I, I think this guy's had a heart attack or something. He ain't breathing. <sighs> Just great. And you know, the statistics in the media will show it as an aircraft fatality. Yeah. It's guys like him that give air travel a bad name. You're telling me. So, if you'll be continuing on with us to Seattle, please remain aboard as we'll be lifting off after a brief 10-minute refuel. But if your departure is imminent, thank you for flying the friendly skies. Oh. 
a message from Iowa senatorial candidate Blap Krindinkel. My opponent, Mr. Clem Labosh, has said that I said that he said that he has never had a say in politics, and that I said that District Attorney Archie Pankerwald never said that Clem Labosh has ever worked for him or on his staff. Now, first of all, I never said that he said that I said any of those things. Second of all, what I said was that he said that I said that he said that District Attorney Archie Pankerwald did say that Mr. Labosh worked for his staff, not what he said. And I'd like to say how angry I am at Mr. Labosh's attempt to confuse you, the Iowa voter. Thank you. Blap Krindinkle. When all's said and done, he means what he says. And nobody better say otherwise. After a hard morning of bullfighting and lion taming, I like to kick back with a cigarette that gives me satisfying pleasure and yet keeps me on the brink of disaster. That's why I smoke Marlboro Heavies. Marlboro Heavies have the nicotine, tar, and strychnine I need. Plus, trace amounts of nitroglycerin, Agent Orange, DDT, arsenic, saccharin, red dye number two, and uranium 235 that I want. All in a king size, 100 or 120 straight, or with an asbestos filter. Smoking a Marlboro Heavy cigarette brings back the spirit of the wide open west, especially the bomb test sites. And every Marlboro Heavy cigarette that I smoke reminds me of what it means to be alive by almost doing me in. Marlboro Heavies are not recommended for the novice or chain smoker. Each pack comes with a warning from the Surgeon General concerning cigarette smoking and your health. Collect all three. Well, gotta go wrestle some alligators. Adios, amigos. <coughs> Marlboro Heavies. For the smoker who wants more from a cigarette than just lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, pregnancy complications, chronic cough, bad breath, yellow teeth, etc. This fall, meet Lenny Grunt. He's overweight, unemployed, homeless. And now, he's moving in with his daughter's family. Hey, Fatso, get off the couch! Oh, Shame oh, on hey. you, dear. Don't oh. you call my father Fatso. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Hey, Lodass, get off the couch! Heavyweight comedy with Heather Locklear and William Conrad in What a Load! Premieres Thursday, after The Simpletons, on Fox. And now, all the way from Kebu Haokan, our sister station in Weedon, China, we have with us today our guest editorialist, Bin Zhu Long. Thank you, Quinn. Hello, you American. You know, I come to America just a few days ago, and I want to be a part of life in this country, so I decided to start going to an American church. You, you American, your religion is just like your movie. You're obsessed with sex and violence. I mean, I go into this American church, and everybody praying to this half-naked bloody guy who was nailed to two pieces of wood. In Chinese church, Buddha not nailed and bloody. He just sit down and smile, but you American, you want a God full of bullet hole and knife mark. You are all of you crazy. And then when I sit down in the church, the priest asked me if I want to eat the guy's body and drink his blood. I say, uh-uh, get the hell out of there, quick. So I decide not to go back to that kind of church anymore. I decide if I have an American religion, I'll be Jewish. But when I go into Jewish church, the rabbi comes to me and shake my hand. I, I had to run away because I know I'm a tetanus shot. Uh, uh, that, that was Bin Su Long, giving us a new, if dizzying, perspective on our culture. Uh, thank you, Bin. Oh, ni lao. This is Sybil Sheepherder. When I finish a long day of acting... I don't bring home the bacon. I load up the lard. Cooking with lard is so easy because it makes everything slip right off the pan and slide down your throat. A solid cake of lard can brighten up any dull meal, and lard has only 2,500 calories a teaspoon. In fact, after meals, my husband and I roll around in a huge pile of it in our shag carpet. 100% pure natural lard. It's good for me. And I'm good for it. Lard. Real food for real big people. Sponsored by the Lard Industry and the U.S. Lard Board. The wind blows. A hound howls. And a distant clock on a faraway hill strikes midnight. It is the witching hour when spirits rise from their graves and walk among the living. A time when anything can happen. A time to collect stories for my 
vault of blood. Men call me the Crypt Creep, and tonight I will take you on a journey into this strange and extraordinary with a little tale that I call Death Knows No Quarter. Our tale begins in the empty deserts of Utah. Um, um, which, which have recently become popular beachfront property. Uh, a young couple, Tim and Janet Rice, are driving along a lonely road. A road that is lonely during parts of the day, but not at this particular time. Suddenly, the innocent Rices get a... Flat. Yes, they get a flat, miles away from the nearest service station. All seems hopeless until Janet sees something. Look, Tim, there's a light on in the window of that black Victorian mansion. Maybe they'll help us. Sure is worth a try. Cautiously, Tim knocks on the heavy door. <laughs> and rings the doorbell. Slowly, the crumbling portal creaks open. And a decayed mockery of humanity greets the astonished couple. Yeah, what do you kids need? Gosh, mister, our car broke down and we need to get it fixed. Their host let out an evil laugh. Huh. And proceeded with his devious plan. I tell you what, I'll call the nearest service station. They'll send a truck over to pick your car up. They can fix it in the station. With a menacing leer, he invited them in. You kids can come in and get a drink, uh, but I'm putting down some new carpet. The place is kind of a mess. Watch your step. As the fearful couple walk down the darkened corridors with their eerie host, Janet sensed something. <gasps> oh, yeah, that's the litter box. I keep meaning to change it, but after three years, the cats still don't seem to mind. Hey, Janet, this place gives me the creeps. Did you just hear that soft, low moan? Whoa, hey, somebody catch that elephant. <laughs> Must have been all that chili I had last night. Let's see. I've still got some coffee left. How's that sound to you? Oh, well, that's fine with us. The host poured two cups of the dark java, and when his guests weren't looking, he quickly put some strange powder into each cup. I hope non-dairy creamer's okay with you guys. I don't see why not. By the way, would you like something to eat? Oh, that'd be great. I'm starving. The host went into his secret meat locker just behind his pantry and returned with a tray of unusual-looking meat. There's some bread over there on the counter if you want to make some sandwiches. Thanks, mister. So tell me, where were you kids going? Well, we had just come from a Mensa meeting over in Salt Lake City, but we... Hey, this meat tastes sort of funny. What kind is it? Human meat! Janet screamed. <laughs> as the host began to tell them the true story behind the meat locker. I'm just kidding. It's just some roast beef left from a picnic. No, no, no! What's going on here? Where's the man-eating ghoul? Where's the blood stain on the wall? Where's that shambling thing from behind the grave? What, what kind of horror story is this? Am I hosting Auto Week or something? What the hell is going on here? You want a horror story, pal? I gotta run in my nylons. Yeah, and you should see the car's repair bill. <laughs> Romeo's Clip here, and at my doctor's recommendation, I have decided to stay away from airports and instead bring you glimpses of the sleazy from its true source. Yes, the American classroom, where students' minds are slowly warped by big words, even as they stick gum under their desks and draw pornographic doodles in the margins of their filth-infested notebooks, where other shocking and horrible things happen, even if I can't name them off the top of my head. They happen, though, trust me. There he is, boys! Over by the jungle gym! Get him! Get that carpet bag! And now, sex, terror, and lust meet in a fusion of suspense that could only be called the educational system. You could call it something else. I probably would, but I don't... Now then, my old canvas nemesis, we have only five minutes to get you on that flight to Detroit. No, not Detroit! Rough him up, boys! No! Ow! 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 Buenos dias, clase. Now today I want to work on our dialogue, so we'll pretend we're in a restaurante. Now, Ronald, you'll sit at this table as if you were a customer, and I'll be the waiter. We'll act like we're in a Hispanic eatery. Okay. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, señor. ¿Querías ver al menú? Do I want to see a menu? Sure. Si quiera ver al menú. Aquí está. 
Yo recomiendo la langosta. Lobster? Gosh, that's really out of my price range. I'll settle for the salad. Ethan, do you have a question? Actually, teacher, there's something I want to ask Ronald. Yeah, Ethan? Just how do you intend to pay for a simple salad? Have you exchanged your American money for the currency of the country you're in? No, I haven't. That's not important to Ethan. And Ronald, have you gone through customs? Have the authorities stamped your passport? Passport? I don't even have a we'll passport. We'll save this for another dialogue. You're in serious trouble, Ronald. The police are probably looking for you right now. I can hide you, but it'll cost you money. Yeah, here's all I got. Okay, okay, we're back in the restaurante. I brought you your lobster, and now you ask for the bill. 23, 24, 25, 26... Uh, not enough, pal. Oficiales, aquí, por favor. Es un problema, señor. Excuse me, this is a closed class? No, I... I can't let them find me now. My people need me. Este hombre es un... How do you say crook? Criminal, senor. Yes, thank you. He's a criminal. Damn you, Ethan. I trusted you. But the ideals like freedom and social justice mean nothing to you, do they? All you ever wanted was power. Come with me, senor. Where are you taking my student? <laughs> oh, sure. You may laugh now, Ethan. But on the day of the glorious revolution, I shall have the last laugh. La Ria Ultimo! Until that day, I and I alone shall be master of the working people. And they will all be my slaves. Damn you! <laughs> Damn you! Class dismissed. Good morning, and welcome to Book Babble. My guest today is Michael Edwin Olson, here to discuss his soon-to-be-published book, You Could Have Been With Me, Babe. And then underneath that it read, But you're not, so you'll just have to console yourself with the idea that I wouldn't be such a mega success if you hadn't dumped me. Is that a working title? I think it works. Very good. I need to apologize to you, Mr. Olson, for I was unable to read your entire book. I was given only the first chapter. Well, there's only one chapter on paper so far, but all I need to do is just park myself down for a day or two. This is an autobiography. Yeah, it just comes right out onto the page. Could you please tell us a little about it? Yeah, it's about my life and the lovers in my life, but uh, mostly it's about the losers in my life. It goes from my college days and my first experiences with women on up to today and my latest posturepedic partner. That's her over there. Get the camera on her. This is a radio show. Uh, too bad. She's more for looking at than listening to. But anyway, I used the real names of my ex-squeezes, but I mixed up the letters to avoid a lawsuit, even though a lawsuit would probably be good publicity. You used anagrams. Uh, no, anagrams was not one of the names. No, an anagram is a mixed-up word. Right, whatever. Anyway, it's not about my career so much. I thought the people would be less interested in the story of my rise to the top than a sort of kiss-off-and-tell book. Oh, on the contrary, Mr. Olson, I'm sure that there'd be many readers who'd like greater insight into your public life. I, for one, was hoping for a recounting of your ascension to, quote, mega-success. In fact, I'm embarrassed to ask this, but I do feel compelled. Mr. Olson, who are you? Though I'm a published writer. You have no books listed in the Library of Congress. I've been published in magazines. Hustler? Penthouse. Letters? Twice. And I'm doing pretty well financially. That hardly makes you a mega success. Oh, yeah? Well, I will be once this book gets published. It is to be published. Well, what else would it be for? I just need to find a publisher. And I bet lots of guys would buy this book. Take a look at the hot house I'm with. Okay, so listeners can't see her, but go ahead, describe her. She's left, and she took her coat. Yeah. So what's your point? What, you think she ran out on me? She knows I'd crucify her in my book if she dumped me. And I can get someone else to type it. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Good day. Hey, if you're listening, you're chapter two, babe. And so another subtle yet dramatic programming day here at KPUT winds down to a close. I'd like to say to all listeners out there, if you've had twice as much fun listening to it as we've had doing it, then we've had half as much fun as you. Quint, buddy, pal, you gotta hide me. Uh, Gromius, what's the matter? Is it the CIA again? There goes that stinking little suitcase, and he's conspiring with a steamer trunk. I, I believe you have me mistaken with someone else. I I'm not a trunk, trust oh, me. isn't that just like luggage? What? It lies around acting friendly and docile, but the minute you turn around, it sticks a knife in your back, it runs over your dog, it sleeps with your wife, it cuts in front of you in the lunch line. Look, I mean, the, uh, I'm not trusting you this time, pal. Uh, Never uh, again. Well, well, while we're getting this straightened out, I'd like to say so long to the audience. And by the way... Enough the talking, you silver-tongued transit uh, parcel. Uh, uh, We've got a flight uh, to Brazil uh, uh, in uh, five minutes. Well, and I'll have you on it, even please. if I have to chase you to all four corners of the earth. Oh, Rough them all up, boys! Oh, I, 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 oh, oh, my God! God. Oh, my God. Oh, I can't just have a coconut snack or something, please. KPUT was produced by members of the radio comedy classes of 1990. Special production by Dave Clayton, Hector DeGene, Glenn Keenan, Brian McDermott, and Stephen Scholes. 
Special thanks to the charming and effervescent Barb Spangers. Join us in two weeks for another episode of KPUT.